He was a methodical and careful flyer who bristled at his own reputation for taking risks. By redefining the capabilities of aircraft, he became a celebrity on a scale never known before and had to go almost literally to the ends of the earth to get away from the paparazzi. He was a beloved symbol of American ingenuity and bravery, but during World War II was refused induction into the Army Air Corps at the direct order of the President of the United States. He was Charles Lindbergh, and he is a legend of air power. Charles Augustus Lindbergh was born on February 4, 1902, in Detroit. He was the son of Evangeline Lodge and Charles Augustus Lindbergh, Sr., a farmer who was elected to Congress in 1906. Lindbergh, Sr. was an isolationist who believed staunchly that foreign entanglements served only the wealthy and powerful. His son, known from an early age as Slim, grew up on a farm near Little Falls, Minnesota, and studied engineering at the University of Wisconsin. He dropped out after two years and moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, where there was an affordable flight school. Flying for Charles Lindbergh was a transcendent, almost spiritual experience. I live only in the moment, he wrote in his autobiography, in this strange and unmortal space, crowded with beauty, pierced with danger. Even after being trained as a pilot, Slim couldn't find anyone willing to risk their aircraft by allowing him to solo. Desperate to continue flying, he volunteered as a wing walker for a barnstormer. They toured the Midwest through the summer of 1922, when Lindbergh hooked up with another act, this time as a parachute jumper. Parachutes in those days were new and untrustworthy, and parachute jumping was thought of as significantly more dangerous than wing walking. He toured as Daredevil Lindbergh, but after another year of risking his life to fly, he still had not soloed. In 1923, Lindbergh's father decided to run for the Senate as part of the isolationist farmer Labor Party. Slim convinced him that an airplane would help drum up publicity. His father co-signed a $500 loan that Slim used to buy an Army surplus Curtis Jenny. He picked the plane up in America's Georgia. And taxiing around the airport, getting the feel of the controls, Slim gave the engine too much gas and accidentally took off. His first solo lasted only a few seconds and rattled more experienced pilots who witnessed it. Returning to Minnesota, Lindbergh crashed the Jenny into a swamp. After making repairs, he hit the campaign trail with his father. Charles Sr. placed third in the primary, but Slim had his airplane. As soon as the votes were counted, he took the Jenny and returned to barnstorming before enlisting in the Army Air Service Cadet Program. In 1924, the Army had almost no interest in aviation. In the isolationist environment after World War I, the armed forces were shrinking. Training concentrated as much on processing Army paperwork as flight and 80% of cadets never got their wings. Slim studied hard and earned a reputation as a barracks prankster. In the air, he was clearly the best in his class. He was selected as a pursuit pilot and trained in obsolete de Havilland's known as flaming coffins. Assigned to fly tedious figure eights, Lindbergh risked expulsion by challenging other cadets to simulated aerial combat. Of the 104 cadets who entered with Lindbergh, 14 graduated. Panicked at the thought of taking the written test to receive his regular army commission, Lindbergh withdrew and opted for a reserve assignment. In 1926, he returned to St. Louis and went to work for Robinson Aviation, which had a contract to fly mail between St. Louis and Chicago. Lindbergh surveyed the flight route and on April 26 flew the first scheduled delivery between the two cities. 
Flying above the Midwest in those days was not much different from flying over the open ocean. There were few highways to follow, and before rural electrification, there were no lights to guide pilots at night. Lindbergh crashed more than once, but always rescued the mail sacks out of the wreckage and hand carried them on to their destination. Navigating between Chicago and St. Louis, the isolation of the cockpit was anything but lonesome for the young pilot. Looking out at the passing countryside, he let his imagination roam. All over the world, aviation records were being set and rebroken. Hardly a day passed without word of another amazing feat. Flying over the endless fields of Illinois, Lindbergh cooked up a plan as audacious as any to come before. He decided to try to do what no one had ever done, and to do it the same way he flew every single day, alone. In 1919, New York hotel owner Raymond Ortiz put up $25,000 as a prize for the first person to fly nonstop from New York to Paris. His offer, he said, was good for five years. Aviation technology was so primitive that no one even tried. In 1926, Ortiz extended the offer another five years. Technology had caught up with his vision, and on both sides of the Atlantic, teams of aviators went to work designing aircraft that could handle the flight. Aviation contests uh, were really what we would consider the X-series programs of their day. We had formalized flight testing and flight research start very, very early in aeronautical history. And these aviation contests, speed contests, altitude contests, distance contests, what those really did was encourage the development of airplanes that really extended the frontiers of flight. The conventional wisdom held that crossing the ocean required huge, multi-engine aircraft, heavy with supplies and fuel. French aviator René Fonck selected a tri-motored Sikorsky biplane. He outfitted it with a folding sofa bed and planned a menu including Long Island duckling and, of course, champagne. On September 26, 1926, Fonk's craft lumbered down the runway at New York's Roosevelt Field and crashed without leaving the ground. Two of his crewmen died in the crash. Admiral Robert Byrd, the polar explorer, assembled a slightly smaller entourage based in a Fokker trimotor. At the end of its first test flight, the plane nosed over on the runway and crashed. In St. Louis, however, Lindbergh was hard at work on his much simpler idea. He approached a group of local businessmen seeking funding for a much more modest mission. One man, flying alone, crossing the Atlantic. Flying alone decreased the payload and the amount of fuel necessary to make the crossing. He could use a smaller plane with a single engine, cutting the weight and fuel consumption even more. Lindbergh raised $8,500, partly by assuring his partners that once the Ortig Prize had been won, he would put the plane to work flying mail from St. Louis to New York. Finding a plane was harder than Lindbergh had thought. Manufacturers of suitable aircraft declined to bet their reputations on an unknown pilot with an apparent death wish. Fokker wouldn't even consider it. A negotiation with Belanca fell through when management demanded the right to name its own pilot. Lindbergh was about to give up when he received word that Ryan Aircraft was interested. Lindbergh, fully aware that others were planning their flights to Paris, gave Ryan 24 hours to design a plane that suited his needs. The Ryan Company, which uh, was a very forward-thinking company, did a superb job integrating appropriate technology into that airplane. They took the radial piston engine, which was a major American development in the 1920s, the highly reliable radial piston engine. They took uh, advanced structural techniques and construction. They took advanced instrumentation uh, that was available. Uh, they adopted the streamlined monoplane configuration to get maximum range and, and reduce drag and put this all together in a very nice package and that of course was the spirit of St. Louis. On April 28th, 60 days after Lindbergh placed the order with Ryan, the newly christened Spirit of St. Louis took off for its first test flight. It had a wingspan of 46 feet and weighed, when empty, 2,150 pounds. The engine was a Wright J5C Whirlaway, 
one of the most trustworthy power plants in the world. A huge fuel tank filled the space between the engine and the cockpit, blocking the pilot's view, but giving the plane a 4,000 mile range. Lindbergh flew from San Diego to New York following a Rand McNally road atlas. In the process, he set a transcontinental speed record of 21 hours and 45 minutes. Though the press assumed that one of the bigger name flyers preparing to cross the ocean would win the Ortigue Prize, the public latched on to Lindbergh as soon as he arrived in New York. He was thin and photogenic and single. The Wright Company, which had refused to supply him an aircraft, outfitted him instead with a publicist who kept the newspapers interested. Reporters inundated him with irrelevant questions about his favorite pie and his preference in women. The New York Times paid $5,000 for exclusive rights to his story. On the morning of May 20th, 1927, Lindbergh posed for a few pictures, looking distracted and impatient. He had not slept the night before. He climbed into the cockpit, his only provisions, a couple of canteens of water and five sandwiches he'd bought the night before at a diner. With 2,700 pounds of fuel in a 2,100 pound plane, it seemed a miracle the plane lifted off at all. At least one member of Lindbergh's crew sobbed that Slim would never be seen alive again. Uh, what's interesting about Lindbergh is that Lindbergh is far more than the popular image of him at the time. At the time, uh, people called him Lucky Lindy, some called him the Lone Eagle, some even called him the Flying Fool. He was really none of those things. He made his own luck. He understood exactly what the requirements were for that mission. He plotted it. He, he planned it. Uh, he undertook it with tremendous deliberation and with a tremendous appreciation of his strengths, his weaknesses, and the strengths and weaknesses of the airplane and every other part of that system that came together. 33 and a half hours after he left New York, Lindbergh circled over Paris. Alerted when he passed over the Irish coast six hours earlier, the French thronged to the airport to see him arrive. More than 100,000 people waited on the floodlit field as the spirit of St. Louis touched down. There are several versions of what Lindbergh first said when the crowd reached his plane. The newspapers variously reported his first words as, I'm Charles Lindbergh, and is this Paris? According to Lindbergh, his first words were, are there any mechanics here? And does anybody here speak English? Uh, with the astronauts in the 1960s, you had at least a year or two of buildup to get used to the idea of one of these seven individuals being the first American in space. Whereas in the case of Lindbergh, he comes, he, he blows in from the West Coast. Two days later, he takes off across the North Atlantic, and three days after that, he's a world hero. You know, he was a man literally of, of, of about two weeks from, from being a nothing to all of a sudden being a, an extraordinary celebrity at, at, uh, at a level of, uh, of public recognition and awareness that, that we really can't even imagine today. Lindbergh returned to the United States on the American warship Memphis. While at sea, he had no idea of the frenzy building around his arrival. Everyone wanted to meet him. There was a new dance craze, the Lindy Hop, named in his honor. The post office was issuing an airmail stamp with his image on it. Congress had created a new medal, Distinguished Flying Cross, so they could honor him in a way no one else had ever been honored. It was like nothing that had ever come before. There were new mass media, radio, and newsreels, hungering for heroes and real-life cliffhangers, fighting fiercely to retain the public's attention. Aviators were natural subjects. Every year, airplanes flew faster, higher, and farther. There were racers who accepted the very real risk of sudden death. Into that highly charged atmosphere stepped Charles Lindbergh, a matinee cowboy of the sky. Tall, photogenic, modest, he was the real deal in a world of artifice, and everyone wanted a piece of him. I think the appeal is the appeal of anything that is new and radically different that is going to transform society. And if we really think about what aviation meant to people, people like Lindbergh, uh, after the beginning of the 20th century, 
Uh, here we had a, a subject in a field of inquiry that was going to radically transform everything. He came home and was at the center of attention no matter where he went. People listened raptly to everything he said, despite the fact that the shy flyer had little profound to say. He wrote a book. In a few days, it sold almost 200,000 copies. I think he was uh, astonished by the public adulation he received after his flight, which he saw as just a very straightforward event. It was certainly not done on his part in a bid to become famous or to become well-known. Lindbergh, who was fairly sophisticated in the ways of publicity from his barnstorming days, had no objection to getting rich. He played the publicity game effectively. But what he really wanted was to return to flight. He considered attempting the Pacific, but no corporation would underwrite anything that put him at risk. So he took the spirit of St. Louis on a national tour. And everywhere he went, the crowds and the microphones awaited him. Sometimes there were so many people at the airport, there was no place for him to land. On a goodwill trip to Mexico, he met Anne Morrow the daughter of the American ambassador and a student at Smith College. Though he said nothing at the time, he noted years later that he was smitten with her from the first. But there was no time to linger, and it was months until his busy schedule of celebrity barnstorming allowed him to see her again. He was not content merely to uh, rest on his laurels. He felt that he had a larger mission to fulfill. And that larger mission was what people termed in those days the gospel of aviation. He had this mission to make America reminded. Lindbergh proposed to his St. Louis backers that they start an airline. With Lindbergh's name attached, both the number of people willing to fly and the market for airline stocks exploded. Lindbergh's partners quickly raised $10 million to start transcontinental air transport, the first coast-to-coast -coast airline. In June 1929, Charles and Anne Morrow married in a secret ceremony. When word leaked out, the media launched a worldwide search to find the honeymooners. And they did, on a 38-foot motorboat anchored in York Harbor, Maine. After their marriage, Charles taught Anne to fly. Vanity Fair magazine called the Lindberghs our first romancers of the air. Together, they made eight transcontinental flights for TAT, they flew over Mayan ruins in Mexico and were credited wrongly with discovering a new Mayan city. In 1930, the Lindberghs had their first child, a son, Charles Jr. Reporters and photographers arrived in force. Charles publicly denounced the press for its preoccupation with his personal life. A year and a half later, the baby was kidnapped. Everyone seemed transfixed by the Lindbergh's ordeal. Clues and sightings of the child poured in from around the world. When police found the child dead only a few miles from the Lindbergh home, press photographers bribed a mortician to allow them to take pictures of the badly decomposed body. From that point on, Charles Lindbergh and his wife uh, draw increasingly into a shell. And it involves, uh, understandably, uh, uh, some very great bitterness. Offended that their private grief had become a public spectacle, they moved to Europe. It is a measure of their disgust with the United States that Europe seemed to them a refuge. Uh, I think they were particularly upset by the way they had been treated by the media at that time, and that resulted in Lindbergh from that point on always having a very distant, cold relationship toward the me uh, media. Uh, they felt so... Um, exploited and abused that it was uh, the cause really for them leaving the United States. In retrospect, it was a continent ready to explode. In the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin set his sights on world domination. In Germany, the newly installed Nazi regime had abandoned the limits set by the armistice of World War I and was building the strongest military force in the world. In 1936, General Hermann Goering invited Lindbergh to inspect Germany's expanding air force. The American air attaché in Berlin urged Lindbergh to accept the invitation, believing that the star-struck Goering would allow Lindbergh access to previously secret German installations. Goering did, and accompanied by the military attaché, Lindbergh got the first close-up look at two of Germany's most potent secret weapons, the Stuka dive bomber and the ME-109 fighter. 
Lindbergh was fascinated by Nazi Germany. It was orderly and disciplined. The streets were clean, the people cheerful and motivated. Berlin seemed the only city in the world where he was not harassed by paparazzi, and he felt safe there in a way he hadn't since he first arrived in Paris. Lindbergh concluded that if war came, Germany would win. He returned to the United States in December 1937, and for the first time began to speak out on a subject other than aviation. Echoing the isolationist beliefs of his father, he urged the United States to keep out of European affairs. He declared the Nazis no threat and published an article in Reader's Digest that is, to modern ears, horrifying in its racism and anti-Semitism. Even after Germany invaded Poland and France, he denounced those who urged support of England as dupes of Jews and international bankers. Lindbergh took a vicious beating in the press. The hero was a traitor, an enemy of democracy, and perhaps most cuttingly, a fool. The crowds that had gathered outside his house to adore him turned ugly, screaming over the wall that America's greatest hero was a Nazi lover. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Lindbergh tried to enlist. Secretary of War Henry Stimson, acting on FDR's orders, refused to recommission Lindbergh, saying that the flyer lacked faith in the righteousness of our cause. Lindbergh went to the Solomon Islands as a military observer. He had a Corsair at his disposal and joined in combat patrols over Rabaul. The other pilots loved flying with a celebrity, and no one complained. He moved on to New Guinea and flew more missions, this time in a P-38. He taught the other pilots a few fuel-saving tricks he'd learned barnstorming, and he shot down a Japanese fighter. When word reached Washington that America's most famous pilot was dogfighting without authorization, the War Department grounded him. Imprisoned by his own fame, he receded from public view. After the war, President Eisenhower reinstated his commission in the Air Force Reserve. He traveled and wrote and spent time with his children. He consulted on aviation projects, including the development of the first civilian jets. The receding hairline and paunch of advancing age became a kind of disguise for him. He was no longer slim, instantly recognizable as the lone eagle. The world, thankfully, had passed him by.